Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Policy Exchange. My name is Guy Newey. I'm Head of uh, Environment and Energy at uh, Policy Exchange. We're delighted uh, to be able to welcome you to tonight's event, starring, uh, starring Francis, Francis Bonnake, which I've mispronounced. Okay. I thought so, yeah. I checked before. Um, Francis, as you face a dysfunctional Congress that struggles to keep itself open, uh, a kind of terrifying debate on whether climate change is happening, angry disputes over EPA standards and new pipelines, uh, it must be a real relief to come to a country that has such a coherent <laughs> and organised energy policy where you, you don't get old prime ministers uh, undermining the entire edifice in <laughs> off-the-cuff remarks. Um, and one thing you don't get here is decarbonisation being used as a political football. So um, that is our lesson to you. Um, but it's a, it's a real coup to have you here this evening. Um, the, the National Resources Defence Council is one of the US's most formidable green NGOs, uh, boasting a huge uh, membership and a, also a rather impressive online support network. Um, a significant international presence, uh, as well as its work in the US, including in particular in, in China and India, on a range of environmental policy. Um, its research is, is outstanding, and its uh, advocacy power, I imagine, for uh, policy makers is, uh, is terrifying, um, and hopefully we'll get a little of that insight um, uh, tonight. It's also been uh, unafraid to take some, some controversial positions, which at Policy Exchange we're all in, all in favour of. Um, Frances is one of the US's leading environmental campaigners herself. She's been president of NRDC since 2006, um, and has worked for the organisation for, for more than 30 years. Counting. Sorry, yeah. Um, and started out in marine and coastal work. Uh, she holds a plethora of important uh, positions. I'm not going to name them all, but uh, the Commission on the Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill, uh, the Advisory Board of MIT Energy. Um, there are also rumours that she may be in line to be the White House's next energy and climate awesome advisor. <laughs> anyway, there'll be plenty of opportunities to ask about that in the, in the Q&A. Uh, I'm sure she'll <laughs> confirm it all. Anyway, um, uh, today she's going to talk about the US uh, energy and climate policy context, although it may, may go into wider environmental issues, um, as well as hopefully giving an insight into successful environmental campaigning and advocacy in a hostile environment, uh, the kind of advice that in the UK may prove uh, very handy. Um, there'll be plenty of time for uh, questions, and in the meantime, if there's got a burning issue, I invite, uh, invite you to tweet away with a hashtag, uh, US Climate. Um, I'd like you to welcome Francis. Thank you all. Um, I hope one of these microphones is on. It's uh, a pleasure to be here at the Policy Exchange, and thank you guys so much for having me. I will give you a little bit of perspective on uh, climate policy in the US, and particularly NRDC's approach to it, and then I hope for uh, a lively exchange of questions, perspectives, uh, comments afterwards. So um, just to start out, let me tell you a little bit about NRDC, Guy told you, but we're an organization that's uh, 43 years old. We started Earth Day in 1970, and we've grown to be a powerful force for the environment in the United States. We're an organization of law and science. We now have over 400 employees. Um, 30 of whom are in Beijing working on climate and energy issues there. Uh, the rest in the U.S. and we have projects also in Chile and um, in India. Uh, in addition to law and science, we have over a million members and activists, which makes us one of the largest uh, citizen active organizations in the United States. And using the power of that voice combined with the power of law and the power of science to formulate effective advocacy on the environment is NRDC's signature issue. We're a powerhouse of information, and uh, if you can navigate our website, which is very dense because there's so much information, you will basically find anything you want to know uh, on the environment, uh, particularly in the U.S. We've provided almost 200 reports this year on various issues, and Alex Kana, who is here, uh, does that work for us, so she could give you um, more specific details, and I'm also joined by Jake Schmidt, who's the, our lead on the international climate negotiations, and Susan Casey Lefkowitz, who's the director 
of our international program. So when we get into the questions, uh, we have lots of deep knowledge here in addition to my own, which um, they uh, can offer some perspectives as well. So NRDC does a lot of things, but uh, first and foremost right now, we're working on energy and climate. We probably have the largest uh, energy and climate practice in the environmental sector in the United States. Over 100 people at NRDC work on these issues, and they're uh, technical experts at the uh, local level, the state level, the federal level, and the global level. Um, we seek to formulate policies that we can both um, design, advocate for, and get implemented. And I think one thing about our campaigning is it's very designed to get results. And so we're constantly recalibrating. And over the 40 years, we're adding tools to the toolkit uh, all the time, um, looking at, you know, <coughs> considering what's the framework we're operating in and what are the tools that we need to be effective now. So we build that on our legal and scientific prowess. but communications, advocacy, political work, uh, research in uh, behavior and uh, on the social side is just absolutely central to our work um, these days. We're tough, we're fair-minded, we're viewed as practical but dogged, and uh, as I said, we really work to get the job done. We view our client as the earth. You're probably familiar with Client Earth. Client Earth here in the UK was started by James Thornton, who was a colleague at NRDC, so we're all in this together. And I think we have a real long-term perspective. I mean, I have been at NRDC for several decades, but one thing I know firsthand is that things take decades. Acid rain took over 20 years to get the legislation in the United States that brought our sulfur dioxide emissions down. It took us 20 years after the ozone hole was identified to put the Montreal Protocol in place. And I think that's an important perspective because it does take a lot of time. We've got to build from the science. We've got to build um, the policy initiative. We've got to build the economic and political case to get the job done. So in the climate arena, we recognize how absolutely urgent it is to act now, and the data and the information that's forthcoming is ever more sobering. But that um, just doubles our resolve. And every time we get beaten back, we dig down and then uh, recalibrate to what we need to do to move forward. So to me, in our climate strategy, there are three key elements. One is policy. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the policy that we are now considering in the United States and NRDC's role in that is, and what our strategy is going forward. One is politics. It's what political situation are we facing. That's not only elected officials, it's the political atmosphere that we're operating in. And as Guy stated, and everyone here no doubt noticed, the United States was closed down for 16 days and our government did not operate. And we are at the height of dysfunctionality. But despite that, we have to design policy initiatives that we can move forward and get adopted. So that's a pretty fierce environment to be operating in. And I think we do have a strategy that can circle around that, which I will tell you about in a minute. And the third part is partners. There is no issue that we are working on now that we can accomplish alone as NRDC, that we can accomplish alone as the environmental sector, and partners at every level. We need to partner with across all sectors. And I often say, and I really believe this, if people take on the climate challenge as an environmental issue, we lose. It's an issue that affects all people. It's fundamentally an issue about human well-being and the well-being of the planet, and it, it crosses all sectors. And we need all sectors engaged in finding the solution uh, to it. So we design the policy, we build campaigns, we build on local models that we develop, we develop strategic partnerships, we increasingly connect with people. I told a story yesterday at um, Chatham House that we did a study on heat preparedness in Ahmedabad because uh, extreme heat is a huge impact uh, on the global south and even in Chicago where several people died and it was extremely hot. And someone said to me, I never knew that NRDC cared about people. And I was shocked by that, and it actually has shifted um, the way I frame the issue, the way I think about the issue, the way I want NRDC to frame the issue. Because our expertise is in energy policy, but this isn't about energy policy. It is about the well-being of people and the well-being of the planet. And 
we have to put that front and center, I think, to win on this issue. We also are doing a lot more work on understanding where the public is on this issue. In the United States, we're investing in message research, in uh, focus groups, in polling, uh, because we, you know, at one point, the United States had a majority of people who believed in climate change, and then that dipped way down. Now it's coming back. But not only understanding how people perceive the issue of climate change, but what lens they see it through, what local issue affects them, whether it's asthma in the city, or their children have asthma because the city they live in is extremely polluted, or they're next to a power plant, or it's because of the droughts last summer that wiped out a huge amount of the agricultural industry of the United States, or the fires that rages across um, Texas and the Rocky Mountain states, or Hurricane Sandy, which devastated my city, New York. And the fact is that last year, the United States spent $100 billion on uh, the disaster relief and insurance from extreme weather events. That was the largest single expenditure beyond the military and our social welfare programs, $100 billion. We cannot afford $100 billion and an increasing number because we haven't addressed the threat of climate change. So one of the things that NRDC needs to do, has to do with our colleagues is really understand what the economic impacts are. To have a solution on climate change, it has to work for the environment and it has to work for the economy. And these two things go hand in hand. So a number of years ago, we created a center for market innovation so that we had much stronger economic analysis than we had in the past. So when we look at climate change and, and creating the policy solution, we're not only looking at uh, what the problem is and what the solutions are, but what the opportunities are. And I think I was at the President's State of the Union message, both at his inaugural message, his State of the Union message, he talked about climate change. We, in the beginning of the first term, maybe you've had this experience, we would count on a single hand, like how many times has he said climate change? You're like, was it three times? Or you know, how many times has he mentioned the word in the first term? So, you know, the great thing about the inaugural speech and the State of the Union, we were past counting the words. We actually had a full-throated commitment to climate change. That commitment is something that we needed to build the campaign around. And, uh, and in the State of the Union speech, what he did was talk about the opportunity of developing the clean energy economy, de developing jobs around new initiatives in the energy sector. He didn't put it in the, these are the problems we have to solve part of the speech. He put it in the, this is the opportunity for the future of the country in the 21st century part of the speech. I think that's where we need to frame it to. So he made the speech. Uh, January 20th, he was inaugurated, I was there, listened to that. Um, I think February 2nd, he made the State of the Union, I was actually in the chamber and I heard that. And then the month started ticking by. And we're going like, when is this climate plan gonna come? And we are part of a very broad community enterprise. In the United States, the national environmental community in, in 2008 made climate change the number one issue, the single issue that we would work together on. So we did work together 2008, 2009, 2010. I'm sure everyone in this room knows that we worked on federal legislation. We did not succeed in getting it passed. 2011, we were depressed. 2000, at the end of, you know, during 2011, we regrouped. 2012, now we have a very robust, integrated campaign across all the organizations that is gonna be necessary to drive the policy to get uh, the climate, uh, the, uh, the carbon um, emission reductions that we seek. So in uh, the spring, starting around uh, March, we start going over to the White House, where's the plan? We had the speech, but we need the plan because to unleash the campaign, we've gotta have the plan. So it took a while to get that, and there's other things, immigration, gun reform, other things. Um, we started ramping up the campaign. You know, we're, um, we have good relationships with the administration, but you can't have good relationships when you're trying to advocate change. You've got to double down and be prepared to be tough. And so the messages started getting tougher. We started um, going out to our activists more and more. Meanwhile, we're saying we're going to do that. And then, uh, you know, finally in June, as we were ramping up, uh, and they heard, and the Keystone Pipeline is a very important part of this, and Susan here runs our 
Keystone campaign, and I think just the significance of Keystone is for whatever reason, and I think this is important in environmental campaigning because it's hard to determine why, Keystone, this tar sands campaign, uh, pipeline coming in from Canada to the U.S. to export uh, the tar sands oil to other parts of the world where we were basically a conduit for them to uh, experience the value of the resource, this caught the public imagination. People started campaigning on this. You couldn't have told me that the public would get ignited on Keystone. I didn't know, I mean, I, I didn't see it coming. I don't know if Susan, who's worked on tar sands for a long time, saw it coming. But when it came, it was really important to ride that wave. And when people started circling the White House, getting arrested, ramping up, and the, the reason Keystone became so significant, first it was something that was a project that just took us down the wrong energy pathway. It was another investment in the fossil fuel industry rather than another investment in clean energy. But it absolutely, it was a demand for climate action. It was stop the Keystone Pipeline, and this is a decision the president can make himself, but it was we need to see you making climate action, and this is not that. This is going down the wrong road rather than the right road. So it became very, very symbolic. So outside of the Washington, D.C. discussion, Keystone is an incredibly powerful driver. And literally, when the president was campaigning for his second term, every place he went, there were people inside the room and people outside the room, people on the streets and people in the rooms that he went to. What about the Keystone Pipeline? You've got to turn down the Keystone Pipeline. So this became... In the beginning, the White House was like, where, where, did the, where did this Keystone Pipeline come from? At the end, they were like, oh my gosh, you know, what are we going to do if we lose all these people, our constituents, because of the Keystone Pipeline? So I think, I don't know what his decision will be on Keystone, but it has ignited a level of intensity that I would say I have not seen for the last 25 years. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, this is a tremendous amount of attention, outpouring, engagement on this issue. It's sort of where environmental campaigning first started around Earth Day uh, 1970. That's, uh, that's what this is like. And I think it's incredibly exciting because, you know, we're talking about the planet's future. We have to hold people accountable. People should go out on the streets, and they are, and that's really good. So what have we been doing meanwhile? Now, the president's made his um, commitment. We, meanwhile, as a policy shop, are trying to figure out, okay, what should this plan be? Dan Lashoff, who's the director of our climate center and a chief climate scientist, put, really spent all, um, I'd say, of 2012, early 2013, well, all of 2012, basically designing what this could be. How do we get the president to act without going to the United States Congress? We do not want to go to the United States Congress. We would fail. Um, so the premise of this plan is to take the single largest source of carbon, which is our power plants, enact a rule under the Clean Air Act Authority to reduce our carbon emissions from the power plant sector. Our analysis shows that you can decrease emissions by 25% in the power plant sector, combining an action on power plants that he can do using his executive authority under the Clean Air Act with the decision that he made in the first administration to double fuel efficiency in cars that gets um, the United States on the 17% reduction trajectory that the president committed to uh, at Copenhagen. It, it, but these things have to happen. So the president did announce on June 25th, and again, I was there, Georgetown, where it was so hot, the teleprompter stopped working and he had to start reading the speech. It was you know, kind of a good sign of what we were all about. Um, and he committed to using the Clean Air Act to control power plant emissions. And so to our climate team on the, the 26th of June, I said, well, we can really celebrate because he has built that plan on our design. And in fact, a lot of the press said that. That's based on NRDC's plan. I mean, it won't come out like our plan, but it is based on our plan. But there is a tremendous amount of work engaged in achieving this plan. It will take every day between now and January 20th, 2017. And if this will not get done until like noon on January 20th, 2017. That's as long as these things take. There are many steps in this regulatory process. It ha they have to create guidelines, they have to have stakeholder involvement, they have to get commented on, and this plan requires the states to each do their own plan, and then those plans to come back and get approved. 
So one of the reasons we were really putting the pressure on the president in the spring is that even people are going, oh, it's the second term, there's all this time. There is not enough time. There is not an extra day of time. And the fact that the government was closed for 16 days lost very important time. So we have to get this done. We cannot miss a deadline between now and January 2017. And we can't miss the objective, which is reducing the emissions to the full level that we see as possible. The worst thing would be to go through this whole thing and not achieve that. Now, you know, we, so how does that happen? Well, there's a lot of regulatory work done at the federal level, and we will work on that. That's what NRDC's bread and butter is. There'll be a lot of back and forth with EPA. We'll engage in every comment period, as will many others in the environmental community. But that is only one of three things that need to happen. There is a huge amount of work at the state level. So we have, uh, I'd say, uh, in the United States, in the Northeast states, and in California, we have very, um, I think, st strong leading programs on reducing carbon emissions. But there are only about 10 states involved in that, and there are 50 states. And if there are only 10 states that sign up, we're in serious trouble. So there is a major campaign, and this is the hardest policy part, working, picking a number of target states, working hard with the utilities, with the um, governor, with the state agencies, getting them to design plans. The beauty of this is that states can design their plans for what their fuel mix is. So it's not one size fits all. If you have, you know, this, this is intended to allow states to figure out how they can get there through efficiency investments, through renewables, through more efficient boilers, through the various mechanisms that they see, but for them to design it for themselves and not say the federal government, this is the way you can do it. It's a good way, it provides flexibility. We think it's the most cost effective way, but there's a huge amount of work to getting that done. So there's the federal level, there's the state level, and then there is the ground game, because not only do we want to design the policy mechanism, we want to win uh, the public debate on this. So we have a very robust um, media um, field program ground game across, uh, an, again, a select group of states. We can't do this across 50 states. It's much too expensive. But we are part of an eight organization enterprise to have a very strong ground game. This whole operation will cost literally tens of millions of dollars a year for this year, next year, and 2016. This is the largest campaign we as a community have ever undertaken. The last large campaign like this that we undertook was in 1980 with the Alaska Lands Act. There's, and that, I mean, I don't know what that cost us in 1980, but I can tell you it was tiny compared to what this is gonna cost. But, this is the only way this can be done. We are going directly against the fossil fuel industry, the coal industry, the oil industry, the gas industry. They don't want to see this happen. The utilities, many of them, don't want to see this happen. But we don't have any choice. This has to happen. So putting together a robust campaign and having important partners. Now, we've had a few skirmishes in the last year um, around renewable uh, portfolio standards in states, requirements in states that they uh, uh, generate a certain amount of power from renewables. There were three fights last summer, uh, one in Missouri, one in Kansas, one in North Carolina, where there was a very specific effort to get those states to undo their renewable portfolio standards. We did a very specific analysis with partners in the business community of how many jobs had been created in the renewable sector. So for example, in two states, North Carolina and Kansas, they had each, um, one had 11,000 jobs had been created, the other 12,000 jobs have been created. And the people who went into the legislature were not us, because we didn't create those jobs. It was the people in the solar and the wind industry who had created the jobs, basically saying, why would you undo this thing that has created 12,000 new jobs in our state? You know, this is a growing in, in, in industry. We are generating new jobs here, and I don't know about in the UK, but I could tell you in the US, jobs are number one. And we can now demonstrate where the jobs are created, we're documenting them every week. We know that there are 200,000 jobs that have been created in the wind and solar industry in the last couple of years. And there are also 150,000 jobs in the newly retooled auto industry. You know, our auto industry, I'm sure you noticed, went bankrupt. And it came back, and that's one of the reasons we were able to get these 
fuel efficient uh, standards was, it was kind of a weakened industry, but it's come back and it's really something that's incredibly exciting, I think. We have a um, very energized auto industry building all kinds of new cars, you know, electrics, hybrids, plug-in hybrids, and creating and, and re-employing people who had been dropped out of that sector. So it's a win for the environment and a win for the economy and a win in some of the critical states in the Midwest that had lost, you know, a huge number of jobs. So, you know, we're looking at what are the strategies that it takes to design something that's an environmental win and an economic win that has support across sectors, definitely the environmental sector, but also at the local level, level and from lots of parts of the business sector. And who are the partners that are going to make this thing happen? And I think it's this kind of a campaign that's required to win. And NRDC is not working in the US alone. Um, we have, as I mentioned, a very robust program in China. We've been working in China for over 15 years on green buildings, energy efficiency, demand side management, how to create uh, a much more efficient energy sector. And we're just about to launch a um, program designing a carbon cap that we're doing in partnership with SIF that would uh, hopefully um, be uh, integrated into the next, um, I guess the 13th five-year plan in the 2015-2020 period. Because, you know, we're looking at where are the major emissions? Obviously the U.S. is really significant. That's critical, that's where we're headquartered, we have to work there. China is very, very significant. Anything we can do to ensure that that coal use peaks and starts going down is very, very important. And we're also working in India, actually figuring out how to unleash um, green buildings, energy efficiency, and uh, actually realize the solar mission, which is a solar requirement that they have established for themselves. So, you know, what we're doing is we're looking at what has to be done to meet the climate challenge, where are the opportunities to do it, how do we shape the policy, and then how do we put in place um, the building blocks, the public support, uh, using you know, every strategy that's available to us to actually realize the goals that we seek because we're about winning, we're about achieving the environmental goals, we're about addressing what we think is the most significant issue, facing the planet and facing people across the planet, that fundamentally it is an issue about people and we have to frame it that way. And, you know, I mean, as I've said many times, you can't be in this field if you're not an optimist. I mean, you can read every index about climate change and that can truly depress you, and it does. Uh, somebody said to me last night, you know, half the time I'm a half glass empty person and half the time I'm a glass half full person. I guess I'm a glass half full person because I believe we can do this. I believe we have to do this. And I believe we actually have the plan that can get it done. So that is uh, NRDC's strategy going forward. There are many elements to it, which I'm happy to talk about as we take uh, questions and answers. And the one issue that I actually didn't address, but I'm happy to talk about it, is the role that gas plays in all this, because I realize that's a growing issue here, and I'll tell you it's a very controversial issue there, too. So thank you very much, and uh, please ask anything you want. And I have my team. <laughs> Um, thank you, Francis. Though we've got plenty of time for questions, I uh, ask that you keep them relatively short. You introduce yourselves, and uh, we'll take one time. I'll start with Stanley. Stanley Johnson, former MP. There is a microphone coming. Around. I know you don't need it, Stanley. No, it's a Former MP, the former director of energy policy at the European Commission. I'm happy for all this so crucial. Two, two, two questions. One, where where do you stand now on cap and trade? in the United States, because that was, you know, very so, much, uh, that's, uh, that's one question, the other one. Would you kindly, um, Francis, give us your view as to what you think is going to happen in Paris in 2015? Not too much simple ones to start. Cap and trade, so uh, everyone here, I'm sure, knows that the um, legislation that uh, was being considered in the United States Congress was cap and trade, and before it was defeated, cap and trade was so vilified that it was completely off the table. The California program actually uh, incorporates a cap and trade program, so does the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative uh, in the northeastern part of the United States. Um, but uh, I would certainly myself not put a policy out there right now that's cap and trade. 
Um, I, and I, let me just, one thing I didn't say is that, you know, eventually the United States needs legislation. There isn't any question about it. So, you know, our view is we get these carbon rules for power plants under the Clean Air Act. Um, that actually starts the, to move uh, the capital flow towards more efficient renewables, et cetera, et cetera, and lays the groundwork for legislation going forward. There are conversations among some in Congress about what that might look like. Um, whatever it looks like, it's not going to be called cap and trade, unless something very dramatic <coughs> happens, which I don't see. And more so Paris? Oh, uh, Paris. I don't know what's going to happen in Paris. Um, <laughs> so, you know, just from our perspective, uh, we hope to use this next period to get the United States to come out with uh, what their next target will be. And, you know, what we're looking at actually based on, um, we're, we're looking at what are the building blocks. So in our work in the United States and China and in India, what are the building blocks that can get us to the next stage of climate commitment? Do I think that we're going to come out of Paris with, you know, a big, um, like, gift of, an international climate agreement with a bow on it that we're all going to cheer for? I don't think so, but I, do I think that we can make real headway there? Uh, yes, I do, but I think it's going to take a lot of work. Just on the, just on the first question, on the, the cap and trade, you kind of suggest that that's dead in the water for a while. What about a carbon tax, is that? So I think a carbon tax is a much livelier conversation. Um, I think uh, the reason it's a livelier conversation is that we have serious deficits and we definitely want to figure out a way to, uh, I mean, the, the, the right wing that might naturally be against something like a carbon tax actually, you know, is looking for, everybody's looking for ways to create revenue. So I think a carbon tax, um, I feel is, I think there's more conversation going on around it. It's less complicated than the cap and trade program as it was designed. It benefits those who are making cleaner investments. So it's not a current conversation. I think the conversations are more kind of in the academic thing <coughs> and they're not lively in Congress, but that's where they should be. You don't want them anywhere to you know? And you know, we're always speculating how long will it take to get legislation in the United States. Well, a lot depends on what the 2016 election results in, who wins after this latest 16 days of no government, how that affects uh, the Tea Party right wing in the United States. I mean, there's a lot of gerrymandering, so whether it actually changes the results of the 2014 election is hard to say. The, the only other thing I'll say is, so the midterm elections are in 2014. Don't expect the United States to come out and make any commitment for Paris until those are over. I'm sure there are many who would like to see that. You will not see that. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, Bob Ward from the Grantham Research Institute at London School of Economics. It's sort of connected to the, the last question. Now, is there any sign of the development of a sort of centre-right narrative that might start uh, re-engaging the Republican Party with this issue? Um, I, I ask that because we're seeing, I think, in the UK, a sliding towards the situation that the US has, where it becomes those who speak out in the centre-right uh, find themselves attacked for mentioning the word climate, and I'm sort of hoping that there might be signs that the US is beginning to find a way back So, to um, I'll just say, at the federal level, we're not seeing that, and I don't expect to see it. I mean, I think Congress is just <coughs> right now. Um, I think that, I mean, what we hope is uh, to start seeing that at the state level. Now, many of the states that we need to target to get these state implementation plans in place are, um, have Republican governors. In fact, the majority do. Um, we've had very good experience working with Republican governors in the past. Governor Schwarzenegger, Governor Pataki uh, were both uh, leads on uh, climate and energy policies uh, when they were in office. So, um, you know, maybe it's Pollyanna, but uh, I'm optimistic that we'll be able to have a different conversation at the state level. And I think, um, I think governors, again, you know, mayors actually are a place where things are happening significantly because mayors make decisions. I think governors make decisions Same here. too. <laughs> really? So, you know, if, if we see movement and um, engagement on the Republican side, I think it's much more have to be at the state level than the federal level. And those, those states that you were targeting, you mentioned in your talk to the, the EPA legislation, the mm -hmm. power plant legislation, 
you, you, you said which ones are those? So, so um, I mean, I, I don't know if I have all of them, but it's Colorado, Michigan, uh, Illinois, Ohio from a defensive standpoint, Pennsylvania, um, Virginia, North Carolina, potentially Florida, depending on the outcome uh, of the 2014 election. It's sort of, you know, where, where are the states where, um, you know, we think that there would be uh, an opportunity to develop some um, good state implementation plans where the politics we think, uh, you know, where they have begun the commitment on energy efficiency and renewables in many of these states that have portfolio standards already. They've made efficiency investments and sort of building on something that's already there. We're not starting from scratch. So, you know, we have, I think, about 10 states and we're targeting 10 more. You know, we, and I know EPA is very focused on states too. Uh, if we got 20 to 25 states kind of engaged in the process, that would be seen uh, as a very positive development. But I just can't emphasize how much work it is. Yeah. And uh, for groups all over the country, we're just one of many. Cool. Thank you. I'm Paul Eakins from University College London, Institute of Sustainable Resources. Um, thank you very much for that wonderful insight into U.S. Uh, problems and potential solutions. Um, three very quick questions. You said you're going to reduce emissions from U.S. power plants. Uh, you will know that one of the results of that has been, for reasons of shale gas and others, that U.S. coal is very cheap and it's flooding across to Europe so that our emissions are going up. Um, and uh, is that our problem that we have to solve? Or is there something that uh, well, you, I you, think you're in? Hang on, <coughs> so that's number one. And this is a parochial issue to do with the university's disinvestment campaign, oh. which is big in the US. It is. And it's led by all sorts of organizations, yeah. including Bill McKibben, whom, for whom I have a huge regard. Uh, I'm a university man, uh, so obviously I'm interested. Uh, Prof. Rob Stavins from Harvard had a blog today saying that uh, he didn't think symbolic actions of this kind meant anything. He didn't think it would affect financial markets, and he didn't think symbolic actions of this kind were interesting, and therefore Harvard wasn't going to take part in this disinvestment campaign. You were saying about how Keystone's had huge and symbolic <coughs> effect. I'd like just to comment on the potential for symbolic actions. And finally, you mentioned China three times in your speech. Um, uh, okay. I, I'm working on coalition of the willing prior to COP15 or whatever it is, you know, COP2015, a coalition of the willing without the US and China clearly is not going to mean anything. Uh, what discussions are you aware of between the US administration and China on getting some sort of climate understanding that they can take to COP15 that is a little um, more thought through than what happened in Copenhagen? Coal flooding across in Europe okay. is our problem or your problem? It's our problem. Universities disinvestment and China. Okay, so on the coal, coal is everybody's problem. I mean, and I and I think uh, you know we all have to recognize that um, we have 134 uh, power plants on the drawing board. So none of them are coal plants. The coal industry is obviously very nervous. If you were in the U.S., you would see their advertisements flooding the airwaves. They flooded the airwaves in the election. You think that coal is the cleanest thing out there, which we all know is not the case. Um, there's a lot of campaigning going on in the United States uh, to prevent coal exports, particularly to Asia, less to Europe because they're trucking um, power, power river basin coal across the northern part of the United States. These open coal trains are going through towns, through downtown Seattle to be exported to Asia. People are just as up and up. I think what's happened in the United States, and I think this is really something to think about, it's certainly very new. Energy has landed in everybody's front yard. So if you lived in the Gulf during the BP oil spill, it was in your front yard. If you happen to be anywhere near the Marcellus Shale or a lot of other shale formations, it's in your front yard, backyard, and underneath you. And if you happen to be on the coal export line, it's going through your community, including downtown <coughs> Seattle, which is a very green place. So where energy has always been kind of at a distant point or segregated in a few states, it's suddenly become a national issue. And everybody's like, what is our energy future here? You know, is it just we're going to drill and uh, explore and exploit every single 
bit of fossil fuel that this country has, or are we going to shift and go down a clean energy pathway? So the, and we've worked on energy for 30 years, and I can just tell you in the last five years, the clean energy, and even more recent than that, like in the last three years, the clean energy debate has burst forth in an actual national conversation. So back to your question on coal, there's a lot of campaigning on coal, but I think, you know, Europe has to make its own decisions on what its energy mix is, and if you don't want coal, don't import it. We would be happy with that. I mean, you know, it's what the market does, and that's where you need policies that uh, promote other things that are cleaner, in my view. So what was the next question? University of divestment. Oh, university divestment. So Bill McGibbon is a great friend. Um, we've seen uh, the divestment campaign um, kind of uh, develop. We're talking about it internally uh, at NRDC, too. And I think, you know, one of the things uh, that's really necessary uh, is to build, um, you know, a much more robust alternative investment strategy so people can put, you know, like a big university endowment with $20 billion, which I think is about Harvard's endowment. 36. $36 billion. So it's a while since I was <laughs> Very fast. It's a good year. A good very, year. very fast. Um, to have a fossil fuel free alternative strategies that have uh, some kind of historical record that they can have confidence in. You know, as I say, I think the clean energy dialogue is growing. I think the divestment debate is going to grow. I was uh, disappointed when Middlebury, the home of Bill McGibbon, decided not to divest. Uh, but I think actually there will be divestment actions and that um, that will build going forward. Isn't there a, ri isn't there a risk in some of this? I mean, a lot of these universities, uh, I don't know what the pools include, they get a lot, they get a lot of research money from, from uh, fossil fuel have, companies. They'll, they'll have to assess that. They'll have to assess that. But, uh, you know, I guess in the divestment area, what I am also very interested in is seeing more and more investment in clean energy and clean tech and, and the innovation that's going to, you know, I'm, you mentioned I'm on this MIT advisory board. When That's where you're optimistic. When you go to one of these universities and actually listen to the people who are doing the research and see the kind of enthusiasm for solving these energy problems, you're like, what can we do to unleash that? You know, how do we set up the policy construct so we can unleash that as quickly as possible? And it's hard because basically the fossil fuel industry owns the policy and has owned it for over 100 years. So unlocking that ownership to allow these other things to develop is absolutely fundamental to getting to the future that we seek. So the last question was on China. The simple. I don't know what the. I mean, I don't know if Jake wants to comment on this. I do not know what the discussions are between uh, the United States and China. Although I know everybody thinks. The United States and China better be talking about this. I'm sure they're talking about it with the specifics are. I do not know. But I mean, you've got 30 staff members in China. We do, but they're working on China energy policy. They're working on energy efficiency, green buildings, demand side management, urban solutions. You know, they're not sitting with Minister Shea every day trying to find out what's going on. Have you ever tried that? It's not very successful. <laughs> I'm being a journalist. I'm being a journalist in China for, for a few years. I know that's not necessarily so straightforward. Um, we'll take some other questions. They've done. To, uh, Dustin, and we'll take uh, the end. Hi, Dustin Benson here from Green Lines. We're a think tank based here in London. I've got a question about populism, shale gas, and Keystone XL. So you said Keystone XL came along out of nowhere. Great opportunity for you guys. Shale gas also arguably came out of nowhere. And I understand you guys have been a bit more positive about it. And I want to understand what uh, uh, you did. Correct me if I'm If you were more positive about it, then was that a simple decision of if it's not top removal coal versus shale gas, get rid of that top removal coal, that's awful? And if so, what now? Given that uh, I think Stanford came out with a study recently saying shale gas is decreasingly going to be pushing coal off the system and will begin to push renewables. Yeah, there's a fact sheet back there on uh, fracking that you might want to take a look at in front of us. But so it's interesting. Um, you know, gas is a very complex issue. I'll just say I've never faced a more challenging issue of many, many issues that I've worked on because uh, it's cleaner to burn, but the extraction is egregious. And it's egregious not only in the practices, but I think it's egregious in the way the industry has treated the people on whose property it drills. And it has created a backlash like you would not imagine. Now, the good thing about the backlash, as I was saying, is 
those voices that are against fracking and calling for moratoriums all across the country are calling for clean energy solutions. And that's, that's recent. You know, it used to be we're against this, we're against this, we're against this, stop it. But I think here there's a recognition we're against this because this is not what we want the future to be, and we want this instead. So we want to amplify that demand for clean energy, and we also want to hold the companies and the governments accountable to protect people in their homes. So, you know, there's no disclosure of the chemicals. It's a patchwork quilt. Every state has a different system. The federal government has not stepped up to the plate. The industry went in and got variances to two major environmental laws because they would say, well, there isn't an environmental problem, so we can have a variance. I would say, you got the variance because you knew there was an environmental problem. And I think that um, we will see for the gas industry to realize what it thinks the opportunity there is, it's going to have to change its practices because people are absolutely up in arms. I've never seen, I mean, you have to go visit some of these frack sites, which I've done in Pennsylvania. And I mean, you, I mean, to me, I mean, we're in the UK, but to me, it's un-American that these companies can go in and take over a piece of somebody's property and pull, put a drill rig down and then put a security officer there to prevent the person from accessing their property, which I saw firsthand. I mean, it's unbelievable. So, you know, I think, actually, I think the gas industry had an opportunity a couple of years ago to handle this very differently. This is a hugely abundant supply. It's, you know, it has completely changed the energy equation in the United States. They could have handled this really differently, but to go in with the, the kind of boom mentality of we're going to, you know, bring all this fracking things in. I mean, go to any of these communities. Go to the oil shale in North Dakota. The whole western part of the state has been absolutely changed. I mean, and changed not only from an environmental standpoint, but from a socio-cultural standpoint. I mean, they, they, you know, they have all kinds of social problems that they never had before in this very rural environment. So, uh, I mean, there is a, a real war going on over fracking and it's because it affects people in their homes and they're scared to death of it and they're concerned about the impact on their communities, on their children, on the value of their property, on the safety of their schools. I mean, you just run down the list. It's unbelievable. But lots of those issues you talk about are local issues. I'm not trying to minimize them in any way. But if you're talking about the wider environmental problem of, of reducing reducing climate, uh, carbon emissions across, across the world. Do you see it as gas and shale gas as part of that, as part of that, that role? Well, you said before, so you said it was the most difficult policy ever, but that's had a very, very challenging I think it's given that gas is part of our energy mix right now. Yeah. I also take as a given that we have to move and transition as fast as we can to 100% clean energy. And if I ever thought we did need to do that, fracking has just uh, increased my resolve on that. The sooner we can get through this and get to clean energy, you know, I think people are, oh, gas will be with us forever. Gas can't be with us forever. The consequences are too great. And also, you know, one of the really unfortunate aspects of this abundance of gas is the price is so low that it's undercut the investments in the other clean energy things that we really need. And that's a terrible thing from my standpoint. You know, that I think three or five years ago we were farther ahead in advancing clean energy because everything thought energy was so constrained. Then gas bursts forth, and it's sort of like, well, it's much harder to invest in renewables and efficiency and these other things. So we can't afford that. We have to move past gas as fast as possible. Okay, some more questions. So we're going to take one back there. I'm Ian Sim. I'm uh, an impact asset manager, which is an investor in clean energy. So I was actually going to ask the softball question on shale gas, but that's just being covered. So just <laughs> carving the ball a little bit. But I'm intrigued as to how you can offer a compelling, inspirational strategy on climate change, but seem to be hedging your bets on shale gas. Surely you can't have the resolution of one without the other. And so I wanted to just say a little bit more about how NRC is resolving that dilemma about the environmental damage from shale gas. More shale gas um, means lower prices at the moment without higher demand. If you reduce coal consumption through the policies you're advocating, doesn't that mean more natural gas demand, which means gas prices go up, which means more uh, fracking. So the problem will get worse if you're concerned about fracking. So you comment on that. Secondly, you comment on the likelihood politically and economically of the relaxation of the exports of shale gas. 
because the world is crying out for gas, particularly in Asia, but also in Europe. The president releases the restrictions on exports, the price of gas in the US will go up, which means more fracking again. We need the gas, you're going to pay the environmental penalty locally if exports are the wrong. So, I mean, this is why fracking is such a challenging issue. You know, NRBC's history for 43 years has been environmental protection. That's what we do. We create environmental protection systems, we write laws, we implement them, we hold the government accountable, we hold companies accountable. The issue of gas to me is accountability has not yet happened. It's a, you know, kind of a boom mentality out there. The governments have not stepped in adequately. People do not feel protected and they don't feel informed. And I think the best thing that we can do with gas now is to really put pressure on that accountability formulation because I think the pressure for gas is huge. We would like to see more terms. We've achieved a moratorium in New York. There's uh, particular reasons for that. That's not gonna happen across the country, I realize gas is given in the country. I don't have to be for gas, I have to be for environmental safeguards. And I have to be for advancing clean energy as quickly as possible and managing the challenges that gas brings. On the uh, export side, we actually don't have a position on exports. Um, we've examined it, it's not in our particular space. I was on a panel um, at, in the uh, Senate Energy Committee uh, earlier this year where I was calling for safeguards because I think first and foremost, the government has to do that. Um, you know, there, there was Dow Chemical that is a strong proponent for not exporting gas because they think, you know, this is a big advantage for their industry and they want it. And then the American Petroleum Institute, a strong proponent for exports because if the price goes up, it's a benefit to them. It's a very controversial issue going on in the United States. I think what will happen, and as I say, we're not involved in it, is there will be some export. Um, how abundant it is, I don't know. I mean, it's just so interesting how quickly the thing has changed. I mean, we were, um, gosh, you know, five or six years ago looking at all these LNG uh, projects that were proposed all around the coastline, and now they're all reversed. <coughs> Who knew? It's amazing, actually. It's an amazing phenomenon. No one saw it coming, or whoever, somebody saw it coming. Aubrey McLean and their test group saw it coming. I don't know who else did. <laughs> Okay, uh, some more questions? Take the one in the front. Um, Dave Greenfield, Local Government Advisor. Um, probably a, a bit of a global strategy question. You mentioned right at the beginning that you view the Earth as your clients. Uh, given the presentation which you made, was excellent, uh, the apathy of the Western governments towards climate change and energy policy, is it time to now shift the balance to Asia, South America, and Africa in terms of our effort for getting this message across? Or is the West still absolutely the key audience for changing this climate change message? Uh, I think it's everywhere. I don't think you can pick one part of the world over another. Now, um, so, you know, as I mentioned, you know, we're in the United States, we're in China, we're increasingly in India, those are the places we pick because that's sort of what our bandwidth allows. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's, I mean, there's no place in the world that is immune to the impacts of climate change. And, you know, I think we need to be engaged in it together to try to figure out what's right for where we are and then what's right for what we can do together. Um, I'm not sure if you're suggesting that we abandon what we're doing here and go someplace else. You know, we're not going to do that because, you know, we're in the country that has the largest historical emissions and we know that and we have a responsibility towards it and we're doing everything in our power to do it. I just ask about the India point. It's not often discussed in the debate. As Paul raised, you know, we talk about we talk about China, we talk about the US, we kind of see them as the uh, the, the kind of you know if we can get those two on side, then we're, we're some of the progress. But India, obviously, huge and growing emissions. What what kind of work and traction are you having? In well, in India, um, what we're doing is using the expertise that we have in energy efficiency and in clean energy and renewables is using that to both do analysis and advance policies <coughs> in those spaces. Now, you know, India, 400 million people don't have electricity. For, those 400 million people, more people than live in the United States, are entitled to electricity. How that electricity is generated, how, you know, ensuring that it is most efficient. I think, uh, I can't remember the number, it was one third or two thirds of, of buildings that are going to be in India in 2020 are yet to be built. 
how those are built, what the building standards are, what kind of energy efficiency they have, the tremendous amount of air conditioning that comes forward, what kind of uh, uh, air, um, refrigerants they use, is, you know, can we address the HFC issue and not be using HFCs? There are a lot of policy um, places that we can, um, you know, offer uh, experience that we're putting forth there with, and we're working with local partners there. We're not, uh, not not in the role nor would we want to be of advocating a particular position in India on climate negotiations. That's not what we're doing. It's more kind of technical expertise uh, on these various uh, areas of expertise that we have. Yeah. Hi there, Keith Hallett from the European Climate Foundation. Um, a very big issue in the European context right now is looking uh, up to the ambition towards 2030 on uh, greenhouse gases and potentially renewable targets, efficiency targets. It's going to be a, a very important play in relation to Paris. So um, I'm very interested to get your take on, firstly, what can be done, I guess, to create mutually, mutual confidence between key economy or economic blocks like the US and China to get a higher ambition outcome across the device, but also what can the world, what can we expect from the U.S. in terms of the level of ambition? And I guess it's different metrics is what the, what the, the climate needs, well, what's technically achievable, what's politically achievable, right? And, and I'd love to get your sense of the. the okay, so I'm not. I don't know what the number is. Maybe Jake knows the number, but I think that our ability to to um, increase ambition will be based on what we can achieve in these investments in efficiency, renewables, and clean energy technologies that we're promoting. So at, we need to be as aggressive as we can be in these uh, carbon standards because the investment that will be made to, the, to realize those, I think, will uh, heighten our ambition. And um, so I think the proof is going to be in the pudding. I also think, you know, it's interesting so there's a lot of clean energy jobs getting created in the United States. I mean, the number of 200,000 in the renewables and wind sector and with solar and wind. It's a lot of jobs. Um, but, you know, those industries, are, they don't have a political operation. Like the fossil fuel industry has a very robust communications and political operation. The renewable industry and, you know, those investing in building efficiency, which is much more scattered, they don't have that kind of political voice. And I think everything that we can do to actually document what those investments are, what kind of jobs have been created, what kind of value has been created from those jobs. Being able to tell that story will help. And so, you know, our job is to put together the building blocks and tell the story and use that as a way to ramp up ambition. The interesting thing, and during the president's first term, he probably went to more battery factories than any other single kind of thing. I mean, he loves, you know, the Secretary Chu went all over the place and loves it. That was never covered. I mean, he would go to these things. You know, he, he made a huge commitment. It's something he's personally interested in. He's personally committed on climate change. I mean, I've heard him talk about it. You know, there's a lot of um, personal commitment there. You know, it's kind of a one-day story. It just doesn't make it. And, uh, you know, that's a problem. We have to figure out how to change that. And, you know, so, so our strategy is to kind of tell the story community by community, factory by factory, state by state, so that people feel the, the kind of connection with what is being created. It's not some lofty 200,000 jobs number out there that nobody can relate to. I think that's going to give it more weight, more ambition, and say, you know, this is, this is a good success story for this country. We should build on this, and the way to build on it is to have more ambition. So that's my optimistic view. Jake, do you want to add to that? Can you tell us what our ambition is going to be? Um, Jake's our climate negotiator, so he must have <laughs> No, I mean, it's a, it's a good debate. We don't know at this point what it will be. I mean, they, what the U.S. has said and what we've continued to say is that they have to put a number on the table um, <clears throat> in advance of Paris. Um, and I think they've clarified that. There were some rumors uh, running around. You know, what, what, the, what the number they can put on the table, given the sort of, you know, the prospect for legislation, I think is an open question. But, you know, many of the measures that we can do under existing law do carry on beyond 2020. The, the car standard already goes through 2025. Um, our proposal for the power plant standard continually will ratchet down. Whether or not the US will <clears throat> sort of take those and capture those in, in the number they can put on the table and, and how we build the sort of 
uh, political case around that as well, because this will also be a, 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 you know, a target that President Obama won't have to deliver upon um, in some sense, and so how, how that message is sort of carried to the next administration and, and how much buy-in they, they have, because they'll have to, to sort it out, and then you know, what the assumptions are about whether or not legislation will come to, to save the day, or if this is all going to be based on the existing law that, that we have. And, and it's an open question um, that you know, groups in the U.S. are engaged in. I know the administration's uh, is starting to engage on it. Um, you know, they're very focused right now on how do they meet the 17% target, which is where we want them focused, um, but eventually, and in, in, you know, in probably the next uh, couple months, we need them to start to build that sort of analytical and that technical and that political case for what the, the next round of their target will be so that they're prepared in Paris to make the, the deeper cuts that we know they need to do. Okay, I'm going to take uh, one last round of questions. I'll take a couple, one here and, and the two there. Just a real quick follow-up. Jules Johnson of Bureau College. Um, it was just <laughs> a quick follow-up to something you said about uh, basically a lack of political machine, basically lack of lobbyists compared to, say, like the prosecutor, which has a you know, strong... And I just wonder whether you still felt there was um, like infighting, say, between renewables, technologies, you know, solar versus wind, and whether that was... Crazy problem with people. No, I don't think so. I mean, we'll take the other two and then we'll wrap them all up. Hi, I'm Laura Ristic. I'm also from Imperial. Uh, I'm interested if you could give us a little bit more detail when you're working in China and what kind of like opportunities you see there, what kind of difficulties you see. My understanding is that sustainability in these kind of areas is quite connected with poverty and government kind of control. So, how do you kind of deal with that in a, as a you know, think tank? Hi, um, James Arnold, also from Imperial. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Imperial College London, it's one of the oh, okay. leading universities. Have you had that? Have you had So Imperial. Two questions. One is just surely whether you, as an organization, have uh, sort of specific efforts targeted at certain media in the US, I can imagine there are certain ones that wouldn't bother with anyway, but um, whether you have approaches towards them, whether that in any sense differs from your approach towards, um, for instance, politicians to the extent that you might see them aligned in any different way or with different levers. Um, and secondly, um, specifically in relation to shale gas, are there any um, steps being taken to uh, or to either take or work towards being able to take, for instance, class actions against um, the fracking companies. Thank you. Okay, the first one was infighting <coughs> in between different renewable technologies. So I don't see any infighting going on, actually. I think um, I think what it is is more of these are small companies. Many of them are new. They don't have the sophistication. You know, last year, maybe you guys read about Solyndra, which was a solar company. They got a federal loan. Uh, and, you, and, you know, it basically became an attack on the whole solar industry. And I actually was in some meetings with the solar industry because we were trying to get some solar uh, thermal facilities sited in the California desert we were working on. And, um, you know, they were, these are small companies. They were focused on getting their permit. You know, they weren't a united band and how do we respond to the cylinder attack. So this cylinder attack became an attack on the whole industry. And I think they lost tremendous ground in the process because they didn't have a voice out there. They didn't have an operation to respond to it. I think that's just a maturity issue. I mean, I think they learned a lot. I think the wind industry learned a lot. There's an American Wind Energy Association, a WIA. They're, you know, they're, they're good, they're growing, and they're strong, but you know, they haven't been there for 100 years. They don't have the deep pockets to tell everybody that they're the answer to clean energy in America, which is the, what the fossil fuel industry tells you at every hour and every minute on every news show that you want to watch. So it's just, you know, it's kind of what the resource level is. The second question was on China and I guess the key opportunities in China. And challenges. <coughs> and challenges. So uh, in China, you know, when we started our work 15 years ago, we really started as technical experts. So we came in with this particular expertise in energy efficiency, demand side management, utility reform, uh, green building design, building codes. And so, you know, what we've really done is look at where are the opportunities. We've worked uh, at the provincial level. A lot of the change happens at the provincial level. We worked in Jiangsu province on energy efficiency. The Economic Development Administration uh, adopted our energy efficient power plant design. It saved them 
something like three hundred million dollars, and you know that plan started being adopted across sectors. And then in 2011, uh, the National Grid Agency, whatever it's called, I don't think it's the NERC, but wherever the state grid is, uh, adopted a demand side management program that required energy efficiency investments across the state grid. So you know our job is to basically look at the opportunities. We're not involved in the political space there at all. We have no intention of being. It's sort of what, where can we help add value because we have a particular expertise. It's not because you have to be careful. Um, you know, it's, it's not our country. I mean, we're, you know, we, the United States allows a system of advocacy, which is not a system of advocacy that's possible in China. And so, we, as I say, you know, we have like over 100 people who work in the energy space and we're offering that expertise. And we do it in partnership with lots of the agencies. We work with various pieces of the NDRC, the Minister of the Environment, on the air uh, pollution law. We did an entire uh, analysis of the U.S. Clean Air Act and translated it for them as it goes section by section by section, how is it structured, how does it work, et cetera, et cetera. So we have an environmental law program, which is training judges and training uh, lawyers in environmental policy. You know, we're looking at what's our value added there, what's our 43 years of experience in environmental advocacy taught us, and, you know, who can we partner with to kind of show uh, how those programs can operate in China. That's what we're doing. And your approach to the, to the media? Uh, oh, our approach to the media. So uh, increasingly, we're very focused. I mean, you know, it's great to uh, have national media attention, and we have a lot of that. But um, we're really focused on telling the story community by community. Um, you know, in North Carolina, we want the North Carolina papers to talk about the 12,000 jobs in North Carolina. We don't care if the New York Times talks about it or not. Um, we do uh, a lot in social media because it's a source that's available to us. Uh, I think increasingly, particularly in this um, effort to get these uh, power plant rules in place, uh, the communications focus will be in the key states we're focused on. I mean, it just, it, it has to be, we want the story to get out there. And it's, in most cases, it probably won't be us in the story, it'll be partners and those who are on the ground doing the work. Um, but I, I'll just say that communications is as important in this arena as the policy work. I mean, without a robust communications program, you just lose. And if I learned anything in 2010, it was that, when we lost the legislation. It was an inside strategy in Washington. We didn't have a national campaign that was adequate. We didn't have a national communications policy that was adequate. We didn't have a media or field program. And, you know, it's like a political campaign. But it goes on for longer. So, you know, it's hard. And just the flip side of that, which is the last question, which is class actions. And oh, class actions. So we're not involved. Uh, I'm sure people are looking at that. Um, we are not, but we do have a uh, community defense project, which uh, we have a group of lawyers who, um, who are available to local communities to be sure that they have legal representation when they go up uh, against challenges with the companies or the states. So, you know, a lot of these towns, uh, are really small. They don't have employees. They have like a supervisor and uh, the tax person, and that's it. They're tiny towns. They're rural. It's rural America. And ensuring that they have legal representation and can represent themselves in court uh, is really important. So that that's the way we're approaching the legal side, making those legal services available. And just one last question from, from me. Um, Okay, so six years ago in the UK and the European context, climate change was a consensus issue, it was a big support for action. In many ways, some of the points being raised have started to, to fracture in uh, quite, quite a fast way and often. Um, what would be your single piece of advice for people operating in an increasingly hostile environment in this terrain? Well, one thing, so, I mean, I don't know if you have the climate skeptics. We have the climate skeptics. Um, you know, for us, I just said, we're not going to engage with those anymore. That, you know, we're going uh, for kind of mobilizing in the middle. There are a whole lot of people in the middle. We've done a lot of uh, research on where does the public stand. There are a lot of people who we can reach without kind of going back and forth on the salvo with the climate skeptics. And in fact, uh, there's a group uh, in the United States, Climate Nexus, which is an uh, expert in climate communications, and they advise us. You know, we were asked to go on CNN or something and debate some climate skeptic. 
And it, don't do that. Every minute that you give them air time, you're legitimizing their point of view. So we're not going to do that. Is it not a risk of ignoring? Uh, kind of, I, as I mean, so. a risk in terms of if you're trying to influence the middle. I and think people listen to okay, so I mean, first of all, everybody increasingly can listen to the voice that they think confirms their view. I mean, that's just the way communications is now. So I mean, there are a lot of people who listen to climate skeptics, and they will continue to. And I don't think they're the middle. I mean, I think the middle are the people who are in the states who are, you know, getting jobs in the solar industry and the wind industry who are working on energy efficiency in buildings who are working in the auto plants, making these new hybrid, plug-in hybrid electric cars. So, you know, we're not going to engage. It, it, it's not productive for us, nor do we have the resources to be constantly engaged in this argument with people who are never going to win over. So we want to actually focus on people where we can show opportunity and that it's real, that the jobs that are getting created are real, the value is real that we're not making it up. I mean, we have to build the case from actual results, not from something we hope will happen. And I think those are the building blocks for success. Okay. We're going to have to end it there. Um, please feel free to stick around and uh, drink what left of the uh, wine. <laughs> it looks like and, wine uh, yeah, we probably are on that too. Um, there's one thing I took away from this is the kind of stamina of some of your campaigning when we talked about every day until the until Every 2017. On, uh, <laughs> on, uh, 11 a.m. January 20th, 2017. <laughs> <laughs> I, I felt exhausted for what, but uh, <laughs> I invite you to, to thank you all and to thank you.